that you have within you the power to not only trust in yourself and in this divine wisdom, and also that you are connected to it through being a part of the environment as well as the environment being a part of you, but to also know that there's an energy, there's a force that will be used to bring to you what it is that you seek. So some of the things that you can do to access this force and to begin to have things show up in your life through this energy is when you first wake up in the morning, ask yourself, how did the conditions of my life that I would like to change first come about? How can I facilitate making conscious contact with my unlimited, invisible source of energy? In other words, stop just seeing yourself as someone that is separate from all of the things that have happened in your life and recognize that there is something that you have been doing to manifest everything that's in your life already. It didn't just happen. Somehow, in some perhaps mysterious way, all that has showed up in your life showed up because of your own inner world and how you connected to it. So just look around and ask yourself, how did this spouse show up? How about these children? How about this furniture that I have? How about this job that I'm in? All of these things. What role did I play in this? Was this just a fortuitous accident of nature? Or am I collaborating in some way that I don't quite understand with the forces of nature that bring things to me? And then begin to take some responsibility for it. Secondly, I would explore the possibility that perhaps the reason you believe that life is limiting is because you've assumed limitation to be in your life. If you don't assume there are any limitations in your life, then those limitations begin to go away. And all of the limitations that you experience and see in your world are really that which is in the physical world. There are only limits in the physical plane, in the right-hand side of the room, as I put it. All of the stuff that you see. Yes, there are beginnings and ends to all of that as our senses perceive them. But in fact, that's really not who we are. Who we truly are, that divine being that is in all things, is unlimited. And when we can give up our forfeiture of our ability to get into that world, we also give up the world of limitations. Whatever picture you are able to create mentally will assist you in knowing that the creative energy is flowing through you. So work on these pictures that you have and make sure that the inner pictures you have of what it is you would like to have, these visualizations, are working with you rather than against you. When you are able to internally picture yourself cooperating with the divine intelligence, it will cooperate with you. If you can't picture this for yourself, if you can't get that inner picture, then you will manifest whatever it is that you are picturing, which is doubt. Another thing that I would remind myself is to never limit the spirit in any way. Talk to your spirit. Talk to this divine intelligence that is you, that is even giving you the power to talk in the first place and to think. And tell the spirit what you want without telling it how you want it to happen. Then retreat in faith and trust. Also, I would keep your mental picturing to yourself. Keep it secret. Keep it private. What you want to attract is between you and God. And the moment that you need to prove it or you need to share it, you take the energy away from its accomplishment and on to the reactions of others. Another thing to do here is to examine all of the supposed lacks and scarcities in your life. Then remind yourself, I created all of this with my thoughts and my conditioning and my beliefs and my actions of my past. Taking responsibility for all that has shown up in your life is the way to transcend the things that you no longer want to show up. Also remember that what you think about is what you become, the great secret of the universe the strangest secret, as my friend Earl Nightingale used to say. What you think about is what you become, what you think about all day long. Be conscious of every thought or every picture that ends up in your head because that's what you will manifest in your life. And if you're doubting that, then you will manifest the doubt. And finally, I would recommend that you begin to act as if what you really want to attract to your life is already here because it couldn't be any place else. Everything that's in the universe is already here. You don't create anything, you just redistribute and you just attract that which is already here to your life. And so, if you are acting as if what you want is already here, if you're thinking you'd like to have health, then you start thinking that I'm healthy. If you think that you'd like to have uh, a divine soulmate show up in your life, you act as if that person is there. And you begin to have conversations with that person and expect that person to show up. If you have... Uh, views, interviews about attracting prosperity for yourself, then you begin to act prosperous. 
You go to places where people who live prosperously are hanging out. You walk around car dealerships that reflect this kind of consciousness. You, you always act as if what you want is already here. It just hasn't aligned yet with your intention. And that's what manifesting is, the alignment of your intention with divine purpose. The sacred or the divine part of you wants something very different than this ego part of you. There really are two of us in each and every one of us. One, of course, is the ego. And this ego is just an idea. You'll never find it in an autopsy. It's not anything you'll ever experience in the physical world. It's just an idea. And this idea says that who I am is special and important. And who I am is separate. Mostly who I am is separate from. And who I am is absorbed in my self-importance. And who I am is insane. Because... Insanity is defined as believing that you're something that you're not. And this idea that we carry around of our separateness, it says over and over again that where I leave off is where you begin. And my separateness keeps me without any awareness of my connection to you or to God or to all of the rest of the environment. It's the separation that this idea has and it is what keeps you in a state of turmoil in your life it's not bad it's not evil it's not wrong it's just the idea that somehow the tribe has taught you and you have taken on this idea that somehow you and the rest of us and God are separate identities and then there's another part of you and this is the sacred part of you and this sacred part of you, what I call the sacred self, what some call the higher self, only wants one thing. It only wants you to be at peace. It doesn't care if you're right or if you're wrong, if you're good or you're bad, if you get a lot or you get little, how much you have, who you're better than, who you defeat, how old you are, how young you are, what color you are, what sex you are. It is not interested in any of that. That's all the work of the ego, the idea of your separateness and your individualism. This part of you, this sacred higher part of you, only wants you to be at peace. My teacher said very clearly, very clearly, directly to me, very clearly, Nisargadatta Maharaj, 15 years ago, very clear. Enlightenment is being immersed in and surrounded by peace in your life. Enlightened people, the, the people that you meet that are truly at that enlightened state are people who are able to express peace, immersed in it, send it out, receive it back at all moments in their life. And when, when someone asks, you know, they've asked me, well, what's the difference between these highly enlightened people and the rest of us? Is it that they have unconditional love and we don't? I say, no, that's not the difference. We have unconditional love. They have unconditional love. We have that. The difference is that they don't have anything else. That's all they have. So that if you're on a cross being crucified and someone throws a spear into you, out of you comes what's inside. All I have inside is forgiveness, is love. That's all I have. In A Course in Miracles, there's this wonderful affirmation. If you don't get anything else today, get this one down, all right? It says, in this moment, it says, I can choose peace instead of this. I can choose peace instead of this. What a great reminder. You know, you're just ready to explode, yeah, and you stop yourself and say, I can choose peace instead of this. So there are essentially two paradigms that I need to talk about. I've talked about before at some of the seminars I've done here. I've written about in your sacred self. But in order to be able to understand manifesting, to be able to manifest you are really understanding this idea that the person in your life who is able to push the buttons that sends you into a frenzy, somebody else could push the same button and you react with love, but that person sends that, pushes that button and off you go and your ego instantly enters into it and you need to make them wrong. 
This could be your spouse. This can be an ex-spouse. This can be a lover. This can be one of your children. This can be a mother-in-law. This can be anybody. It can even be a stranger. And they push that button, and you go into a frenzy. Frenzy. <laughs> what is happening in this moment is that this is a divine master who has showed up in your life that you should be kneeling down and paying homage to and saying, thank you, thank you, God, for sending this divine teacher into my life. I know your ego is really having a tough time with that. <laughs> but what is happening in this moment is, here is someone who is teaching you in this moment that you have not mastered yourself yet. That's what they teach you in this moment. And that is your soulmate. That is the person that you need to be able to send love from a peaceful inner expression that says, I could choose peace instead of this. And when you are in a relationship with that person and they push the button and you are able to be at peace, truly at peace, not acting. Now these great spiritual teachers come disguised as manipulative, cunning SOBs very often. And there's only a few of them in the whole planet. But they move around a lot. Right? <laughs> and they got a lot of disguises. But until you... And the test for you to be able to do this is very, very simple. It's a very simple test. Something you can work on when you leave here today. You can work on it the minute that you walk out of here with that, that one that won't flush. <laughs> Who keeps coming back. When you have the choice to be right or to be kind, you pick kind. You pick kind. The higher part of you says, be at peace. When you're at peace, you react with kindness. The ego says, be right. It's much more important to be right. Why do you think I subtitled this book, Making the Decision to Be Free? You are only free when you lose your self-absorption, your sense of separation from those that send you into those frenzies, and your sense of separation from God. Because God is that divine organizing intelligence that is in all things, including this person who is pushing these buttons and keeps showing up. One of us is suffering any place on this planet, and a part of all of us is. The only difference between all one and alone is just one L. A good example of that is watching my mother with my grandmother. My wonderful grandmother, who was almost 96 years old, was dying, and my mother was taking care of her. And she would go in there with a banana, and she would pull the uh, peel down, and she would mush the uh, banana up in her uh, hands or in her mouth, like a mother does to her baby. And she would feed it to her mother, and she would cradle her in her arms. And she would take her underwear, which when you get very old and you're uh, getting close to the end of your life, you kind of forget about your hygiene habits. She was always extremely clean, but toward the end of her life, she just lost interest in that. And my mother would take her clothes, her soiled clothes and underwear, and wash them and help her put them back on again. And she would hold her in her arms and put food into her mouth and massage her neck to make the food go down. And I looked at there, and my mother was uh, 68, I believe, at the time, and my grandmother was 95. And I looked at them and said, who is mother and who is child? Uh, which one is which? And wasn't it just an instant ago in time, if there is such a thing, wasn't it just that much time ago that it was reversed? That the one who is now the baby was the mother holding the other one and putting bananas into her mouth and cleaning her underwear and changing her diapers and all of that? And it really brought home the essence of we are all one. And time is just sort of our way of defining what happens in sequence in life. But it doesn't have any meaning. I mean, uh, there's really no time in the world. There's only just the world the way it is. And each of us must accept that if any one of us have any suffering going on, then all of us are a part of that.
and that's our responsibility. See, you can't get this transformation that I'm talking about in one year or ten years. The wonderful Chinese proverb said that if you want to think a year ahead, sow a seed. If you want to think ten years ahead, plant a tree. And if you think a hundred years ahead or more, educate the people. Once we educate the people and raise a few generations of people who won't be soldiers and who won't kill and who do love and who do see all of us as one and who understand that a person in Japan who is unemployed as an auto worker is just as much of a human problem as a person in Detroit, even though our proximity dictates that we are more compassionate toward the person in Detroit, that's just because we can't think globally. We're only thinking locally. And that it's still any human being who is unemployed is a problem for all of us. And any child who is starving, because they're in Africa, a continent and an ocean away, doesn't mean it any less affects all of us. A lot of people operate under the assumption that I give my love to people who deserve it. And that's a mistake, isn't it? Everyone deserves it. Everyone. Gandhi said, hate the sin, love the sinner. And that's a very important line, very important philosophical approach to life. Hate the sin, love the sinner. The things that people do are things that we can help them to correct and to change and within ourselves and other people and so on. And we can teach them and help them to grow to not be destructive. But everybody deserves our love. And until we start thinking that way, we're going to always have dichotomies. We're going to always have you versus me, us versus them. And as long as there's that usness and meanness and you-ness, there will never be a all of us together. See, what we need to do is all go up in a spaceship and look down at the Earth and see this fragile little planet that we live on and that we are all one on this planet and that we must all recognize that instead of looking for all the things that separate us, instead of building more weapons to destroy us, we must begin looking for ways that we can all get along. And as hokey as it sounds, if we don't do it, we won't survive it as a species, or it'll be left to generations, billions of years from now, who can evolve past the Holocaust that we'll create to learn the essential messages of all great religious leaders, all great spiritual people, all great philosophers, that we are love, and that we are the essence of what makes this whole thing work is all within us. And the truth won't be revealed to any of us until we recognize that we're a part of that truth. We're all a part of it. And we're all one. Having a mind that is open to everything and attached to nothing sounds easy until you think about how much conditioning has taken place in your life and how many of your current thoughts were influenced by geography, the religious beliefs of your ancestors, the color of your skin, the shape of your eyes, the political orientation of your parents, your size, your gender, the schools that were selected for you, and the vocation of your great-grandparents, to list only some possibilities. You showed up here as a tiny infant capable of an infinite number of potentialities. Many of your choices remain unexplored because of a hopefully well-intentioned conditioning program designed to make you fit the culture of your caretakers. You probably had next to no opportunity to disagree with the cultural and societal arrangements made for your life. There may have been some adults who encouraged you to have an open mind, but if you're honest with yourself, you know that your philosophy of life, your religious beliefs, your manner of dress, and your language are a function of what your tribe and its heritage determined was right for you. If you made any fuss about going against this preordained conditioning, you probably heard even stronger voices insisting that you get back in line and do things the way we've always done them. Fitting in superseded having a mind that was open to new ideas. If your parents were Jewish, it's unlikely that you were raised to honor and respect the Muslim religion and vice versa. If both your parents were Republicans, it's improbable that you heard the virtues of the Democratic Party extolled. Whatever the reasons our ancestors may have had for not having open minds, it's true that they inhabited a much less populated world than we do. In today's overpopulated world, we simply cannot continue to live with those old styles of closed-mindedness. I urge you to open your mind to all possibilities to resist any efforts to be pigeonholed, and to refuse to allow pessimism into your consciousness. Having a mind that is open to everything and attached to nothing seems to me to be one of the most basic principles that you can adopt to contribute to individual and world peace. No one knows enough to be a pessimist. Find an opportunity to observe a tiny little green sprout emerging from a seed. When you do, 
allow yourself to feel the awe of what you're seeing. A famous poet named Rumi observed, Sell your cleverness and purchase bewilderment. The scene of an emerging sprout represents the beginning of life. No one on this planet has even a tiny clue as to how all of this works. What is that creative spark that causes the life to sprout? What created the observer, the consciousness, the observation, and perception itself? The questions are endless. A short while ago, Earthlings in the space program were moving a tiny vehicle on Mars via remote control. Invisible signals took ten minutes to travel through space and arrive to make right turns and instruct a scoop to pick up some Martian real estate to examine. We all marvel at such technological feats, but think about it for a moment. In an endless universe, Mars, our closest neighbor, is the equivalent of moving a billionth of an inch across any page that you might be reading. We move a little vehicle on a neighbor next door, and we're so impressed with ourselves. There are billions and billions of planets, objects, and stars in our galaxy alone. And there are uncountable billions of galaxies out there. We are a speck in an incomprehensibly vast universe that has no end to it. Think about this. If we found the end, would there be a wall at the edge of the universe? If so, who built it? Even more perplexing, what's on the other side of the wall, and how thick is it? How can anyone be a pessimist in a world where we know so little? A heart starts beating inside a mother's womb a few weeks after conception, and it's a total mystery to everyone on our planet. In comparison to what there is to know, we're only embryos ourselves. Keep this in mind whenever you encounter those who are absolutely certain that there's only one way to do something. Resist being a pessimist. Resist with all your might because we hardly know anything at all in comparison to what there is to know. Can you imagine what a pessimist who lived only 200 years ago would think about the world we live in? Airplanes, electricity, automobiles, television, remote controls, the Internet, fax machines, telephones, cellular phones, and so on. All because of that spark of open-mindedness that allowed progress, growth, and creativity to flourish. And what of the future and all of your tomorrows? Can you picture faxing yourself back to the 14th century? Flying without machines? telepathically communicating, demolecularizing yourself and rearranging yourself on another galaxy, or cloning a sheep from a photograph of a sheep? An open mind allows you to explore and create and grow. A closed mind seals off any such creative explanation. Remember that progress would be impossible if we always did things the way we always have. The ability to participate in miracles, true miracles in your life, happens when you open your mind to your limitless potential. You begin by ending your search for love. I say it again. You begin by ending your search for love. No more searching. So what does the poet mean by those that go searching for love only make manifest their own lovelessness? Well, when you seek something, you feel that what you're striving for is missing from your life. If it's love, for example, then what you're really saying is, I'm experiencing lovelessness, and in my seeking, I hope to fill this void. But the problem with this approach is that rather than filling the love void, it only puts you further out of balance, and lovelessness continues to be your experience. Why? Because you're weighted more in lovelessness than in lovingness. Your thoughts are focused on finding what's missing, while your desire is for love to flow into your life. This kind of misalignment continues to attract more of what's missing. What you're thinking about is the love that's not there. The universe cooperates by matching up vibrationally with precisely what you're thinking about. How does the universe know to do this? Well, it's merely matching its vibration to your thoughts through the law of attraction. You need to turn off the searchlights and dismiss the search party and instead replace them with an energy of loving thoughts an internal knowing about receiving love. You originated from a place of spirit. That's defined by love. When you begin rebalancing your life so that your desire and the way you think and behave are a loving partnership, you'll realize that your desire is really God-realization. The longing for love is a longing to become more like God in your thoughts. With this awareness, you soon realize that searching outside of yourself for what you already are is the ultimate folly. No one else can give this to you. As D. H. Lawrence says, the loveless never find love. This is because the loveless are focused on not having what they desire rather than on what they already are. 
Furthermore, the loveless believe that they're unworthy of the love they desire, and guess what? They continue to attract more evidence of their unworthiness. With the searchlights turned off and the one-person search party given a permanent rest, you can turn your attention to balancing the authentic means at your disposal for receiving abundant love. This, then, is the irony, summed up perfectly in the poet's conclusion that only the loving find love, and they never have to seek for it. Becoming the Love My definition of love goes beyond the admittedly delicious lust and excitement that you experience when you first become infatuated. Ultimately, these inflamed passions fade away, and what remains is authentic love, or the balance you're seeking. And what is a prime example of this? It is to love as God does, to extend the caring that defines your very creation outward whenever and wherever possible. Love of this nature leads you to forget about your own ego and want what you desire for yourself even more for another. This is how the act of creation seems to work. Your creator doesn't ask anything from you in exchange for giving you life. It's given freely and abundantly, and no one is excluded. You don't have to repay God for giving you this life, or the air you need in order to live, or the water you drink for your very existence, or the sun that sustains you. Without any of these freely given ingredients, you wouldn't continue to live. This is the love that God offers you. To balance your life with more lovingness, you need to match your thoughts and behaviors with those of your source, being love in the way that God is. This means noticing when you're inclined to judge yourself or others as though you or they are unworthy of love. This means suspending your need to be right in favor of being kind toward yourself and others, and deliberately extending kindness everywhere. This means giving love to yourself and others rather than demanding love. This means your loving gesture of kindness is heartfelt because you feel love flowing from within, not because you want something in return. A tall order? Not really, unless you believe that it's going to be difficult. Lovingness is a feature of your natural state, and your ego isn't part of that state. Ego dominates because you've separated yourself from your God self, the loving self that came here from a place of perfectly divine, unconditional love. You've carried this ego idea of your own self-importance, your need to be right, for so long that you've deluded yourself into believing that the ego self is who you are. Talk about being out of balance. You've opted for a belief in pure illusion. By allowing this illusion to be the dominant force, you've created through your ego-centered self a heavy imbalance in your life. The result is that you want to feel love, the real thing, the love that is the very essence of your being, the love that you are, but you feel emptiness instead of lovingness. Why is this so? Because the emptiness can only be filled with love by opening your heart connection to the spirit of love that originates you know not where, but can be felt within you. It's your empty space, no one else's. Therefore, only you can fill it. Your objective is to ask love within you to make its presence known, to have an awareness of being so full of love that this is what you have to give away. That's all you have to do, ask and receive. By doing just that, you'll attract more of what you're giving away. The key to balancing your desire to be at peace with your need to achieve, perform, and earn a living is in recognizing that there's no such thing as stress. There's only people thinking stressful thoughts. It's really as simple as that. When you change the way you process the world, the world you're processing changes. Stress is an inside job. You can't fill a container with it because tension isn't a physical item or object. There isn't some thing that you can point to and say, there it is, that's stress. It simply doesn't exist in that form. Yet 112 million people in America take medication for stress-related symptoms, which include fatigue, heart palpitations, indigestion, diarrhea, constipation, nervousness, excessive eating, rashes, nail biting, loss of appetite, insomnia, anxiety, irritability, panic, moodiness, memory lapses, the inability to concentrate, ulcers, obsessive compulsive behavior, feeling upset, and on and on goes an almost inexhaustible list. And they're all caused by something that doesn't exist in the physical world. Being out of balance on this stress measure results in being one of the millions of people requiring medication to manage the symptoms listed above. It means that you often feel exasperated because you never really enjoy the life you work so hard to achieve. You may frequently feel as if you're spending your life running on an endless treadmill. All of the pressure of working and striving may have many worldly rewards, yet at the same time, there's a feeling of going absolutely nowhere. 
If this sounds familiar, it's a signal to begin reconsidering ways of processing thoughts about your life and work and start pursuing freedom from the symptoms of stress by becoming more balanced. Getting into balance isn't necessarily about changing your behavior. Certainly you can pursue stress-reducing activities such as meditation, exercise, walks along a beach, or whatever might work for you. But if you continue to align yourself with achieving more, defeating the other guy, winning at all costs, and going faster because you believe that's how to keep up, then you're guaranteed to attract the vibrational equivalent of this thinking into your life, even if you do yoga and stand on your head chanting mantras every day. Stress reduction is about realignment. You become what you think about all day long. You also become how you think all day long. To measure the weight of your thoughts, you need to think in terms of vibration and energy. Let's suppose that you have a high-frequency desire to be a person who has no symptoms of stress. Let's assign this thought a 10 on a scale of 1 to 10, with the lowest energy thought of 1 representing a nervous breakdown and a 10 representing enlightened, peaceful mastery. Next, you need to note the thoughts you have that support your desire for a peaceful, stress-free life. Thoughts such as, I'm overwhelmed. I've never had enough time. I have so many people wanting so many things from me that I don't even have enough time to think. I have so much more on my plate than I can handle. And I feel pressured by my need to make money to pay my bills. Aren't balanced and peaceful. These thoughts are resistant energy, which counters the desire for a peaceful, stress-free existence. In other words, they're non-aligned and out of balance. Your desire may be a 10, but your mental energy in this situation is in a much lower range, perhaps a 2 or 3. Simply changing your behavior isn't going to get you back into balance. You're still attracting symptoms of stress when you say no to people and their demands, but vibrate to a frequency that's thinking, I really should be doing what they ask of me, or... Maybe I can squeeze in their requests a little bit later on if I adjust my schedule. You may have pulled back from an overly full and frenzied schedule, yet you continue to radiate thoughts of fear and scarcity that will activate the law of attraction to bring you fear and scarcity. If stress thoughts are tipping the scale, that's what the law of attraction brings. Remember, you become what you think about. If you're thinking scarcity or anger or fear, guess what? That's what the law of attraction attracts. Even with a well-balanced schedule that allows for more free time and even with plenty of stress-reducing activities on your pared-down personal calendar, if you fail to align your thoughts with the success you're capable of attracting, the weight of the dominant thoughts will tip the scale away from a balanced life. How you live your daily life will remain out of balance, and you'll have failed to assimilate the essence of Gandhi's advice that there's more to life than increasing its speed. What you most need to learn is how to create a match between what it is that you desire in your life and what thoughts or vibrational energy you're choosing to attract those desires. Realigning your point of attraction, the art of becoming. Here's one of my favorite quotes from my teacher in India, Nisargadatta Maharaj. Quote, there is nothing to do, just be. Do nothing, be. No climbing mountains and sitting in caves. I do not even say be yourself, since you do not know yourself. Just be, unquote. This idea may contradict everything you've been taught and how you've lived so far, but let it sink in anyway. If your lifetime inventory of ideas and rules has contributed to your being one of those 112 million who use medication to handle non-existent stress, you can certainly afford to entertain this thought. As you begin practicing the principles to realign with a vibration that matches your desire for a tranquil, peaceful life, you'll become more conscious of your thoughts. These thoughts of yours literally determine who you are. And the fact that you're listening to these words suggests that you're interested in becoming more conscious of your thoughts. Being and becoming are used synonymously here. In order to restore a sense of balance between your desire for tranquility and your desire to meet the requirements of your life, you must practice becoming and being the vibration that you desire. Being peace. Peace isn't something that you ultimately receive when you slow down the pace of your life. Peace is what you're capable of being and bringing to every encounter and event in the waking moments of your life. Most of us are waging a non-stop internal mental skirmish with everyone we encounter. Being peaceful is an inner attitude that you can enjoy when you've learned to silence your incessant inner dialogue. Being peaceful isn't dependent on what your surroundings look like. It seldom has anything to do with what the people around you think, say, or do. A noiseless environment isn't a requirement. St. Francis's famous prayer states it better than I can. 
make me an instrument of thy peace. In other words, St. Francis wasn't asking God to provide him with peace. He was asking for guidance to be more like the peace he trusted was his source. Being peace is different from looking for peace. There's two concepts here that are very important. One is the question of willing something to happen. All right. So what they think of when they think of, uh, of having faith is that, uh, all right, on August the 13th, if there really is a God, uh, or if this really works, then I will get the phone call that will give me the biggest break of my life on August the 13th, and that's the way it's going to be. Or maybe even in just some small way, like um, on September 15th, I will uh, get rid of this wart that's on my nose or something. So it's like willing things to happen in the universe. That will lead you to frustration and disbelief and an absence of faith and the awakened life or looking at life from the enlightened perspective that I'm talking about and discovering this inner universe will always be like just outside of your grasp if you're testing God or testing the universe in some way. So that's like willing things to happen. Just through the power of my will, I can make it happen. The second principle here is what I call being willing. In this case, it's different than willing something to be. This is called being willing for it to be. And that is a whole new way of testing the universe. It isn't making a demand. It isn't, if I can get this bird to land over here on this branch, and that's going to be the signal that I'm looking for. It isn't anything like that, because the universe doesn't work that way. And uh, it is like, I am now going to be willing to allow what it is that I want to happen, to happen. I'm going to be willing. I'm not going to demand anything. I'm not going to ask uh, anything special for it to happen. I'm just going to be willing. Now, I'll give you a really bizarre example of this. I was meditating in, uh, on Maui this past summer. On a couple of occasions, there would be peacocks which would walk through the grounds in this particular place where I was meditating. I can remember trying to get them to come to me. Like, oh yeah? Let me see if I can make this peacock walk over to me. It just ignored me. Like, uh, it was maybe 30 feet away. And then when I stopped that, stopped demanding anything, stopped trying to prove anything, and I just really, t you must emit some kind of a different energy or a different feeling or whatever, because when I did that, almost every morning after doing that, the peacocks would come over and literally stand right next to me where I could touch them. And they usually will stay further. In fact, I had grass in my hand one time. I came over and literally ate the grass right out of my hand. And it would happen morning after morning when I was willing. If you're attempting to will something and demand something and prove something, I find that that very demand is a judgment and it's a doubt. And that doubt itself interferes with the natural and perfect way the universe is unfolding and you in it. Whereas if you stop the demand, that is stop the doubt, and just allow yourself to be, I'm saying to you, instead of willing it to happen in your mind, be willing to allow it to happen. Picture whatever it is that you want to picture for yourself and don't make any demands on it. And understand, if you understand the new physics, the quantum physics, that in quantum physics, Fritjof Capra and Gary Zukov, both of them talk about this in their books, the Tao of Physics and uh, the Dancing Wooly Masters and the Seat of the Soul, that when you observe an object in the universe, whatever it is, even a stone, that the actual observation of the object itself has an impact on it. Just the observation of it. Your presence in and around any object in the universe at the tiniest, most sub-sub-subatomic level that you can get at, they're discovering that just your presence of observing something has an effect on it. So if you are observing something with a demand, and you can come up from the quantum level 
through the subatomic, sub, sub, subatomic, to subatomic, to atomic, to the physical world that you experience, understand that your demand, or your observation of, or your judgment of, or your insistence upon, is enough to keep it from happening and allowing it to unfold in its natural perfection. Whereas your willingness, that's the difference between faith and a demand. Faith is like, I go with it. I know. And then I start seeing miracles around me all the time. Whereas the doubting Thomas, or the person who's trying to test it all the time, will find that their very testing of this kind of phenomenon will in itself emit enough doubtful energy to keep it from working for you in your life. You are both a physical body in a material world and a non-physical being who can gain access to a higher level. That higher level is within you and is reached through the stages of adult development. I present these stages with some degree of expertise because I've spent many years in each of them. They have been stepping stones to my awareness of my higher self. Each stage involved experiences that permitted me to move ahead in my thinking and my awareness. There are four stages of adult development. The first is called the athlete. The word athlete is intended as a description of the time in our adult lives when our primary identification is with our physical body and how it functions in our everyday world. This is the time when life seems impossible without a mirror and a steady stream of approval to make us feel secure. The stage of the athlete is the time in our adult development when we are almost completely identified with our performance, attractiveness, and achievements. Obviously, it is healthy to take good care of your body by treating it kindly and exercising and nourishing it in the best way your circumstances allow. Having pride in your physical appearance and enjoying compliments does not mean you are body fixated. However, if your daily activities revolve around a predetermined standard of performance and appearance, you are in the stage that I am calling here the athlete. The second stage is identified by the word the warrior. When we leave the athlete stage behind, we generally enter the stage of the warrior. This is the time when the ego dominates our lives and we feel compelled to conquer the world to demonstrate our superiority. My definition of ego is the idea that we have of ourselves as important and separate from everyone else. The ego-driven warrior objective is to subdue and defeat others in a race for the number one spot. During this stage, we are busy with goals and achievements and competition with others. This ego-dominated stage is full of anxiety and endless comparison of our successes. Trophies, awards, titles, and the accumulation of material objects record our achievements. The warrior is intensely concerned with the future and who might be in his way or interfere with his status. The third stage is identified by the term the state's person. The statesperson stage of life is the time when we have tamed our ego and shifted our awareness. In this stage, we want to know what is important to the other person. We've begun to know that our primary purpose is to give rather than to get. The statesperson is still an achiever and quite often athletic. However, the inner drive is to serve others. Authentic freedom cannot be experienced until one learns to tame the ego and move out of self-absorption. When you can let go of your own thoughts about yourself and not think of you for a long period of time, that is when you become free. The statesperson stage of adulthood is about service and gratefulness for all that shows up in your life. At this level, you're very close to your highest self. The primary force in your life is no longer the desire to be the most powerful and attractive or to dominate and conquer. You have entered the realm of inner peace. It is always in the service of others, regardless of what you do or what your interests are, that you find the bliss you're seeking. There is one stage even higher than the state's person, and this can be described by the word, the spirit. When you enter this highest stage of life, regardless of your age or position, you recognize your truest essence, the highest self. When you know your highest self, you're on the way to becoming a co-creator of your entire world, learning to manage the circumstances of your life, and participating with assurance in the act of creation. You become, literally, a manifester. The spirit stage of life is characterized by an awareness that this place called Earth is not your home. You know that you're not an athlete, a warrior, or even a statesperson, but that you are an infinite, limitless, immortal, universal, and eternal energy temporarily residing in a body. You know that nothing dies, 
and that everything is an energy that is constantly changing. This inner infinite energy is not just in you, it is in all things and all people who are alive now and have ever lived. You begin to know this intimately. When you reach this level, you're in the space I think of as being in this world, but not of this world. Most people think of the spiritual world as a future occurrence that they will know after death. Most of us have been taught that the highest self is something that you cannot know as long as you're trapped in a body. However, the spirit is now. It is in you in this moment, and the energy is not something that you will ultimately come to know, but is what you are here and now. The unseen energy that was once in Shakespeare or Picasso or Galileo or any human form is also available to all of us. That is because the spirit energy does not die, it simply changes form. It can't die because it has no boundaries, no beginnings, no ends, no physical characteristic that we call form. That energy is within you. Gaining the awareness that you have a higher self that is universal and eternal will lead you to gaining access to the world more freely and to participating in the act of creation or manifesting your heart's desire. The fact is that everything in this physical universe doesn't meet the definition of what is real. Who you are is that soul that I spoke about a few moments ago. That soul that says, I want to expand. I want to be free. I want to go to a place where I understand that who I am is birthless, deathless, changeless, and live from that place. Because what this involves fundamentally is reprogramming yourself from the belief system that has been your ego. The part of us that has come to believe that who we are is what we have, and who we are is what we do, and who we are is what other people think of us, like our reputation, and who we are is separate from each other, and most egregiously, who we are is separate from God, from our source. And so we've been raised and taken out into the world and said, go out there and prove who you are by achieving, by accumulating, by getting other people to like you. <clears throat> I wrote a book and did a film not too long ago called The Shift. And one of the, thank you. <laughs> and in there I spoke about and used these words. The direction we take in life is far more important than the place that our ego parks us in this present moment. That who we are is this divine, infinite being that keeps occupying new bodies endlessly until we leave this body and then move on. And there is no beginning. There is no end. There is only now, each and every one of us. So the soul, the part of you that is extraordinary, the part of you that came into this world and knows I can be anything, I can do anything, I can accomplish anything that I place my attention on. Because if you want to accomplish something, you must first just expect it of yourself. And this means changing around the expectations that you've been conditioned to believe are your dharma or are your destiny. I am limited. I am <clears throat> not entitled to prosperity. I am unable to deal with my physical ailments. I need something else. I need to take pills in order to do it. I need to have somebody else do it for me. That within each and every one of us, there is this marvelous knowing that is really and truly God ourselves, each and every one of us. The soul does not like when you get fenced in, when it is told what to do, when it's told it has limitations, when it's told it can't become that. And so many of us go through our life with these enormous limitations that we've placed upon ourselves that have been handed to us from the time that we were little boys and little girls. 